Can a Christian struggle with homosexual thoughts? If a person is struggling with homosexual thoughts, does that mean that person is not a Christian? I want you all to listen to a small segment of what Jackie Hill Perry is speaking about. Now, Jackie Hill Perry is um, a Christian commentator. I don't know what her role is. I think sometimes she gets some, some things wrong. I haven't been a big follower of hers, uh, but I know that she's come out of a homosexual lifestyle. Now, that being said, let me just say this. Because she used to be homosexual does not mean that she is an expert on it. No more than a person who has been shot is also an expert on bullets. That's not what that is. Now, what we can say is, now she might be right, she might be wrong in her assessment, but what we can say is all of us can become experts in the word of God and what he says. And has he spoken on the matter? He surely has. But I want to listen to what she says and compare what she says to scriptures and see, can a Christian still have these desires for a homosexual relationship? We can sometimes make the gayness the big thing that we focus on and not seeing that the sexual practice is coming from a heart that needs to be renewed. And the renewal of the heart won't necessarily mean a change in sexual preference. Is that true? Well, before we before we make a statement, before we cast a judgment one way or the other, let's listen to some more of that. I already know that there are some folks that when they hear that, it's going to trigger some thoughts either in agreement or in disagreement. The renewal of the heart means that this person will prefer God over everything else. So... I think if you just focus on the most obvious sin, then you miss praying more specifically for the need, which is that their heart will be made a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. So what do you think about that? Now, we'll listen to some more of what she has to say, because she's going to make an error. In, and I don't know how much this error that she makes is a part of her explanation, if it leads her to her conclusion or it's just something that she just used to kind of um, buttress up her conclusion. But... What if we were to apply that to other sins? And the reason why we focus sometimes too much, maybe, on homosexuality is because it's out there. You can see it. There are those that would put it in your face. We're not really worried about or talking about the folks that struggle with it, and we never know it. But we're talking about those that want us to know it. Matter of fact, want us to affirm that. And so if a person, let's say, has wanted to kill someone before, does that mean that the person, if they have a changed heart, that they still desire to want to kill somebody, what would that say about the person? Would we conclude that the person who still struggles with wanting to kill people, and I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious in this, but not really, but I'm actually being serious, what would we say about that? Or the person that wants to steal from someone, they, just, they, they want to go and take things from somebody, or someone who is just coveting all the time. They always want what others have. Does, is that an indication of maybe there has not been a change in that person's heart? Could be. Um, and so that's what I would say. I, I think another thing I would say is that pray in the direction of Paul's uh, counsel to the church in Corinth when he, he talks about um, fleeing sexual immorality. And he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice, practice, practice. So he's not talking about nouns. He's talking about verbs, adjectives. He's talking about people who are practicing the behavior, not experiencing the attraction. The distinction is important. So now she says the distinction is important, but that's the problem. She makes an erroneous distinction. And this is where you have to have your Bible. And this is where the language is coming. So let's go to that passage, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It says, so do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, um, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this word that we're talking about, uh, she says it's a verb, and I'm not sure if she's, if she's confusing two. It can be uh, malakoi or arsnikoitai. The malakoi, that's the effeminate, those that, that maybe not are gay, but they act that way, they care of themselves in that, in that way. And then the arsnikoitai, uh, this is the, the two words put together, man betters. And so 
she makes a distinction saying these are the, the verb, those that practice, practice, practice. Well, the problem is these aren't verbs. Arsenokoitai, this is a noun. As a matter of fact, it's a nominative noun. And then also malakoi, same thing. It's also a nominative noun. And so they, this cannot be a verb. So it's not speaking about those that practice those things. These are the people that that's what they are. So she's making a distinction and saying that that is what's important. These nouns and verbs, they mean something. They're important. The problem is, it's just not there. So if this is how she comes to her conclusion, well, then that's a faulty basis. If she's just using this because it backs up her conclusion, well, then even still, you're using something faulty, something erroneous to make a claim. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed. Notice he didn't say, but you were straight. Yeah, but see, yeah, he didn't say, but you were straight, but this is referring to all of that stuff. It's not just homosexuality. And so I think the problem is, the issue is you focus too much on that. I'll deal with this issue of, of how do we deal with people who are struggling with these, these temptations, these thoughts in just a little bit, at least what I've done in the past. He, he didn't say, but you were heterosexual, but you were married. Like that, that's not the prayer. The prayer is that you are washed, meaning pray that they'll be cleansed from their sins. But you were sanctified. Pray that the Lord will set, set them apart and make them holy. And, and, and then he says, you were justified. Pray that the Lord will make them righteous and remove their guilt and reconcile them to the Father. And how does this happen? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The simple fact that it happens by the Spirit of God means that you don't have the capacity to save your child. A lot of what she says is good. A lot of what she says is, is fine. But a lot of what she says is, is, is just wrong. And it just makes me wonder if she really understands what salvation is because a person that she sent pray that God would do those things, this is that that person would be, to be justified is to be saved. Um, to be washed, to be cleansed, that's to be saved. And what's washed, what's cleansed? So let's go to the scriptures and let's just point out some things and let's answer this question. Is it possible to be saved, to be a Christian and still have these sexual thoughts, these desires, these homosexual thoughts? Uh, and is there a difference between having a, being saved and having homosexual thoughts or, or homosexual lust versus heterosexual lust, meaning that if a man who is saved, if he sees a man and lusts after that man, is that the same as a man who lusts, sees a woman and lusts after her? Well, let's wait for a second. Let's go back to some scriptures, though. Let's go to Romans 12, 2. He says, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, he says, by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, uh, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And so this renewing, this comes from this, from two words. This is ana and kainos. This is kind of an up and knowing. The ana is kind of upward pointing, um, and this is not us. Uh, and then this kainos, which is new, so it's Kind of a weird way of putting it. This is up new. Now, by the way, this is not a verb. This is a noun. This is what's happening. Uh, it's the process. It's the whole, the, the, the totality of it. And so that he says that be transformed by this up newing, um, by what God is doing, what God has done, the process. That's why it's a noun. Uh, and so it would seem to say that there is something that is going to be changing in that person. The reason why we bring that up is because also, Paul makes a statement in Titus 3, he says, he saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. How did he do so? By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So how new are we if we are renewed? Or how renewed can a person be? Well, Paul addresses this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, so whoever happens to be in Christ, if that person is indeed in Christ, the Bible says he's a new create creature. All things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that a new creature in Christ, a new creation in Christ, uh, doesn't have any of the old struggles? Well, it can't mean that because if that's the case, we all have a problem because all of us at some point in time might struggle with something that we struggled with before we came to Christ. Now, what is going to happen is this repentant heart of ours, this inward man, has changed in terms of our disposition. We don't like it. We do not like sin, either ours or the world. But that doesn't mean that we are immune from sinning ourselves. And it, But it should cause us to not want to intentionally go after sin, though there are times we will. Does that mean that that person has not been changed? Well, again, 
all of us are going to have some old proclivities pop back up. Could that also mean that homosexuals can have those thoughts pop back up as well? Well, we're going to have to look at the scriptures some more and see. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 1, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses. And so all those different things you did and thought you were dead in those in which you formerly walked. Now this, we can go ahead and talk about it being an actual process, but our walk was what we were as well. Walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of this air, uh, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience among them. We too all, look what he says, formerly lived in the lust of the flesh indulging, doing, this is the verb now, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath. Now, this seems to indicate that there was a doing of the thought. And so there's a separation between what we did and what we thought. So there seems to be this ability to think certain ways, but not give in, not walk according to those things, not walk according to the flesh, as Galatians 5 would tell us not to do. Um, now, we see in Romans 1, though, this might muddy it up a little bit as well. In Romans 1, he talks about, says, therefore, God gave them over in their lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creator creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged naturally function for that which is unnatural and in the same way also men abandon the natural function of women now what we're speaking of is this lust this passion is burning in their heart and they would actually do it and he gave them over to that fine you go ahead as god would or we would say you do you if that's what you want to be but what about the person who might have those thoughts every now and then even if it's men with women because clearly that's not godly as well what about a person who is saved a man who who sees a woman and thinks that looks nice, she looks nice, and then might have some sort of lust attached to that. And even if it's just fleeting, if it's just passing, once she's out of sight, he doesn't think about her. But what if that's a man? Same thing happens. Spiritually, is there a difference? Well, there might be. There might be. Um, that part is going to be a little bit difficult to say, but what I can say is this. What I can say is this, and Paul does make, make this distinction as well. There is a distinction between the doing and the desire. That part needs to be brought up because there's always going to be this sin in us until we no longer have this flesh. Paul brings this up in Romans 4, 18, I mean 7, 18. He says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. Now, this is Paul making a statement. That is, in my flesh, according to the willing uh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing is not uh, uh, of the good is not there. Now, the willing, the word that's used there is the leo, which is this with this desire. I want to do right, but the doing, uh, that part is there. This proso or this poe, this doing, the verb, I keep doing the wrong things, but my mind, I don't want to. He says, for uh, the good that I want, and there it is, the good that I fellow, I desire. But I do, but I do not do. This is a poil. So I, I might do this, but I don't desire to do so. And so we can kind of see the distinction. But, but I practice the very evil that I do not want, phalo, want, desire to do. So Paul's point here is that there is a distinction between those that are doing it and those who don't want to. There's a desire to do and not to do, and then there's a doing and not doing. The person that, and let's just make this relevant to this issue of homosexuality. The person that might commit it, but their desire is different, they struggle with it, that shows a person has been saved. That shows a, a person is, is changing, not necessarily changed totally, but is changing because their desire is not to do those sexual sexually deviant things, be they heterosexual or homosexual or other things. Whatever the sin is, and you place in that spot whatever sin it is, if there is a desire to not do those things, the desire to be holy and you still succumb. Now, the question might be asked, well, how often are you succumbing? And does the number of times that you succumb indicate where your heart is? Could be. Again, I'm not an expert on how the heart is changed as it relates to different sin, nor is anyone else, nor is Jackie Hill Perry or anyone else. God is. What we do know that is if you are a person in this particular sin and your heart and your desire is still to do those things, 
and you want to do those things, but still do those things and hope that you will be free from uh, persecution, hope that there will be no uh, consequence. Well, that's a person that has not been changed. But if there's a person who, who may struggle, but sincerely does not want to do those things, that's a person that could probably state that there's an indication of their heart being changed. Now, I said earlier that I would share what I've done in the past when someone has struggled with different sexual sins. And I've been around some of the worst because of where I've been. I've been around some of the worst. I've been around those who are transgendered. I've been around those who are sex offenders, you know, those who had these desires and so forth for smaller children, for younger children, teenagers, prepubescent, all of that, as well as those who are just your, it's funny we have said it this way, but now you're run of the mill, you're old fashioned homosexuals who just adult males want to be with other adult males, adult females want to be with other adult females. And what have I, what have I done? And there's been success with all those groups. Well, with all those people, it's been the same thing. I didn't have a, a, a transgender way of sharing the gospel or counseling and a, uh, a lesbian way and a homosexual way and a, uh, a pedophile way of doing it. No, I didn't have that. I didn't have a sex offender way of doing things. It was all the same thing. The whole point was to introduce them to Christ, to get a, to get an encounter. Because I know this, that if you are in Christ and he does the changing, and so your mindset is not focused on the sexual sin or whatever the sin is. No, the goal is not to stop being gay. The goal is not to stop being a thief. The goal is not to stop being a liar. Now, the goal is to recognize that you are a thief, a liar, a homosexual, what have you. That's the goal to recognize that. But then the goal is, after recognizing that, to come to Christ, to place your faith in Christ. Christ is the goal not moving away from the sin, recognizing the sin. Because if you spend time on a three-point step or a 12-step process to get away from this particular sin, you'll still you'll keep dealing with that sin. But if you take a take that one step after he's made the first step to place your faith in Christ, then everything else seems to work. And that seems but will work out. Now, how long does the process last? I can't tell you. That's that's between that person and God. Uh, it also depends on the yielding of that person because there are times where you know you, you you do fight, but this is what you do. And I don't care if you're if you're struggling with sexual sin, if you're struggling with any other kind of lust, if it's financial, if it's something other physical, something with drugs or addiction. The way that a person can be set free is through Christ, and I'm convinced that there are many Christians. As a matter of fact, we know, and obviously the stories vary, but a Christian who places his faith in Christ, that person can be changed completely thoroughly without any other lingering lust. Amen.